So um, today I was going to spend a lot of time talking about all of the sites that are in Florida that date to older than um, 9,500 years ago, but this version of the talk that still has all the images in it will be a lot more about Paige Ladson than I was planning to be, so some of you, that will be exciting. Some of you, you'll be like, oh, I've heard about Paige Ladson before, I don't care. But um, we'll do what we can. Also, am I way loud? Because I have no indoor voice. <laughs> um, so, basically, uh, I wanted to start off by talking to you a little bit about some of the really big, important questions that people who do paleo-Indian archaeology are looking for. Choir? Yeah, I'm very loud, so I usually don't need mics at all. Um, and a lot of these questions, so basically scientists have been researching when and how people got to the Americas, probably since the first people got to the Americas. They probably asked their grandparents how they got there and when they got there. Um, but really since the 20th century, there's been some big picture questions that researchers have been asking over and over. When did people get here and where did they come from, right? And in recent years, there's been three proposed routes. Um, and based on genetics data, based on archaeological data, based on paleoenvironmental data, this is really nice for us as scientists because those set up as three different mutually exclusive testable hypotheses. Paula, I didn't see you. Hi. <laughs> um, and so this has been, um, basically archaeological data should be able to answer that, right? But there's also a whole bunch of other questions that we want to address as well. So most recently, most of the data seems to indicate that the first Americans came from somewhere along the western coast of the Americas by coming from Asia, because all the genetics data sits with that. But we also want to know these other big questions, right? How did they spread? How did they live? What was their world like? How did their life ways change over space and over time, right? And those are the questions Florida archaeology promises to answer the first. Because unless they were time travelers from the future, Florida was not the first place people got here, right? So it answers questions more about those latter things, right? But when I started in archaeology, we thought we knew what the answer was. We thought we knew when and how and where people came from, how they got here. It was a settled question. And in the time I've been in archaeology, which is 25, more than 25 years now, um, that has changed completely. And now we don't know any of those answers and more, but we think we have some indications of them, right? So the Clovis first model, which you all probably learned in school as well, states that people using Clovis technology, distinctive Clovis technology, cross the Bering Land Bridge from Russia to Alaska and passed through the Canadian Ice Free Corridor around 14,000 years ago, spreading throughout North and, Mount and South America by 13,000 years ago. That that covers everything, right? Um, but very recently, over the past 15 years, there's been increasing hypotheses or increasing challenges to these hypotheses. Things that are making us think that maybe we no longer know everything that we thought we did. And where this starts is understanding what Clovis is. So Clovis is a distinctive stone tool technology that's found everywhere in that map that you see yellow. Um, that's where you see distinctive Clovis technology. It's in all of the United States, basically a little bit in Mexico, a little bit in Central America, a little bit in South America, but guess where it's not? In the Ice Free Corridor. It's not in Alaska. It's not in Asia. None of it's been found anywhere in there yet. The other thing that's considered to be a big challenge to it is that this is what Clovis technology looks like. We have blades and um, blade tools. We have fluted points, the Clovis points themselves. And we have this distinctive way that those Clovis points were made by this technology that's known as overshot flaking or utrapasse flaking. Basically, Clovis people would hit a rock with big rock and hit it pretty hard and just be able to send the shock waves across the stone in such a way to come straight to the other edge. And ideally, they wanted to go just to the other edge as a way to flatten out their stone tools so that they would maintain a flat and cross-section shape throughout. 
Um, and that is totally diagnostic of Clovis technology in North America as well. And if you're lucky enough to work in Florida, you also have other technology that is also diagnostic of Clovis people. And what these are are ivory rods made out of elephant ivory, extinct elephant ivory that was found in the Osceola River, right? And so when you're lucky enough to have preservation, they also made these. Um, and what we find, though, is not only is Clovis really geographically confined, and all those black dots on the map are the places where uh, Clovis material has been dated, um, but over, we also have these red dots and those green areas. Those are places that overlap that time span, 13 to 25 to 12, 675. There's sites there that have archaeological material that isn't Clovis material. So if the Clovis people are first, and they're the ones that are spreading across the entire landscape, how can there be anything else during that time? Like, unless they aren't first, or unless they're breeding their cousins that do things completely differently than them at the same time and leaving them on the coast because they don't like them or something. It's really hard to explain that. So that's a big challenge to the Clovis first model, right? So. Maybe the answer we were taught isn't, and this is a scatter of the sites along the coast and our dates from, maybe it's too hard to see from the back, um, sorry about the blue on blue thing, um, yay technology. Um, but basically the, the, the answer that we're, the challenges we're seeing is the Clovis span's really short, right? 400 years is not just, okay, we spread across the entire continent, it's like we spread across the entire continent at a run while having many, many, many babies, which doesn't happen in hunter-gatherer societies. And anyone in here who's had children would say that they're not planning to march thousands of miles while bearing children at the rate of like one or two a year, right? Like, if your husband's asked you to do that, you probably punch him in the mouth. Um, so, like, there are some challenges to that, right? And there's so there's this non-Clovis stuff in North America, in California, and South America, and there's no Clovis that's been found in Alaska and Asia. And now that last challenge is probably the weakest of them because Alaska and um, Northeast Asia are incredibly dense boreal forests that are incredibly hard to work in, and I've had very little archaeological surveys. So it's possible Clovis could still be found there because of the amount of work that has not been done. Like, the people who work in Alaska literally have to strap all their worldly possessions on the bottom of a helicopter, get dropped off on a river valley, and then somebody comes back in three weeks to see if the Kodiak bears have eaten them or if they're still alive. And they can only work during a little bit of the year, and there's permafrost everywhere. So there's not been that much excavation compared to, say, Tennessee. Right, so there's a lot, there's some stuff we could still find, but that is still a challenge to our understanding, right? Um, and in South America, there are more than a dozen stratified sites with dates that date within the Clovis range, and that's a lot bigger challenge. South America is a long ways from Alaska, on the other side of the continent, in fact, literally. So if people are there, at the same age or older than the Clovis sites, how did they get there first, right? Like, that's a big challenge, because the materials that they have are definitely not Clovis materials at these older sites. There is some Clovis-looking stuff that's younger. So those are challenges to our overall hypothesis. So that has led to some folks, some researchers, um, who have said that perhaps then, since nearly all Clovis points are found in North America, was Clovis invented in North America, south of the ice sheets? Did people invent it in, in the Americas? And in fact, some people have said, hey, the most Clovis points we know about are in the southeastern United States. Did they invent it in the southeastern United States before they spread everywhere else? which would mean there has to be people here first, right? Clovis points didn't invent themselves, and they didn't make themselves. They're rocks. And therefore, there is a possibility, if that was the case, that there had to have been people here to make it, or, you know, really clever chimpanzees or something, which we have no fossil evidence for either. Um, so what we think, then, is that there must have been, some of us think that there it's really worth looking at these older sites that have been known about for a while to see if possibly, just possibly, 
any of them are credible sites, right? And this is handful of sites in North and South America that date to older than the Clovis period. And they contain some interesting materials. They contain bifaces, bifacial to tools, uh, all the places that are gray up there. They contain osseous technology that looks similar to the Clovis ivory rod you see. Um, and some of them contain just human DNA, which you would think would be a smoking gun for people being on the landscape, right? However, there's some discussion about whether or not that DNA is coming from a well-sealed context and stuff. So, um, maybe. But all of these sites have been challenged in various ways, including um, the Page Lazen site, which I'm going to be talking about to you today. And it's hard to answer these questions for a lot of reasons. It's not that we've been doing this for 100 years and we suck at our jobs. I mean, maybe, um, but I'm going to pretend like that's not the case or I'm going to get home and not have a job and that'll suck too. But it's also because it's really, really hard to answer this question. So during the end of the last Ice Age, during the terminal Pleistocene, the world was a very, very different place. Florida was more than twice as big. 21,000 years ago, this was the coastline of Florida, way, way out past the Florida mid or the middle ground. And sea levels at this time were about 130 meters lower than present, so almost 400 feet lower than they currently are, which means there's enormous swaths of land that would have been really great for people if they're coastal people that are now in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. In fact, most of the Gulf of Mexico didn't exist as the Gulf of Mexico then. So there would have been all this land that would have been great. And that's because 21,000 years ago, that's a picture of the globe and on, the, there was so much ice everywhere. And there were mammoths and mastodons and in Florida, tapirs and sloths and horses and camels and glyptodons and short-faced bears and saber-toothed cats and all of these other animals that would have been both eating people and people could have eaten that would have led to really different patterns on how people live. As were the plant associations. There are and pollen records from Florida in the late Ice Age. There are evidence that there were plants that are currently tropical plants and plants that are currently like alpine plants living in parts of Florida together at the same time. So it was a world totally different than today. And the process of it becoming the world that is today means so many gallons of ice melted and spread across the landscape, eroding river channels, drowning sites, and basically geomorphically changing the world. And I got this slide a long time ago off the internet, and I think it's so interesting to show people. This is the amount of ice 21,000 years ago on top of the city of Toronto with their skyscrapers, Chicago, Boston, and Montreal. So that in those exact locations, that's how much ice was on top of them. That's how much ice melted, scouring the landscape as it went from glacier to ocean. And that's why there's been so much change. And so many Paleo-Indian sites are so hard to find. They've either been drowned, scoured, deeply buried. Something else has happened. So there's a lot of geology involved in trying to answer these kinds of questions. And therefore, let me give you the two terms. I should have had this slide earlier. Usually I have this slide earlier. Um, basically, what I'm going to be talking about today is the terminal Pleistocene. So this period, from the last glacial maximum, which is 21,000 years ago, to the earliest Holocene, which is 11,500 years ago, right? Um, and radiocarbon years, for those of you used to thinking of those, that's 18,000 radiocarbon years ago to 10,000 radiocarbon years ago. So basically, but it's 21,000 to 11,500 years ago. And we as archaeologists call these people Paleo-Indians. Now, we need to think of a new term for this because most of our indigenous friends think that that's a pretty insulting term, and we all agree, but we haven't come up with anything better yet. So for now, 
paleo Indians is the term that we use for those folks that lived during the latest part of the last ice age. And it's not meant to be pejorative, but the implications of it sometimes are. And so sometimes people feel that way about it. Um, so basically, though, how do we answer questions about who got here, when they got here, and what the sites mean, right? We have to answer them using a set of rules that were set out by a really famous geoarchaeologist, Van Tains, in 1969, but they were rules of thumb that had been using, used for a long time, right? In order to say that you have an unambiguous site, so if you want to say I have the oldest site in X or I have any site at all, these are the rules for saying that you have an archaeological site. Most of us subconsciously just apply them all the time. You're like, this is a flake. It was obviously made by people. But we're all kind of running through this checklist, right? First of all, you have to have something that was made by people. And that's either clear artifacts or human skeletal remains. Obviously, those have to be made by people. Um, we have to find that evidence in undisturbed geological deposits. And the association between those geological deposits and those cultural material has to be clear. And Ideally, it has to be datable. Great if it can be dated by radiocarbon, but association with extinct fauna or something like that can work too. That's how we originally knew people were here during the end of the Pleistocene. It was well before there was such a thing as radiocarbon dating in 1923 when they found stone tools in association with Folsom Point at Folsom, New Mexico. That was really clear evidence that people had been here at the time that those extinct animals lived. Um, but that's a hard sell in most of Florida. So right there, that picture on the top, you can see my really muddy towel. That's a pile of debitage around a mound site in the Osceola River Basin. That's what most terrestrial sites look like. That one, in fact, was a pile of looters spoil right next to a hole they dug in the mound site. And that's what was left behind. They took diagnostic artifacts with them. There was an open gaping hole and some artifacts. Um, most of Florida doesn't have directly datable sites. Most of Florida has clay, sand, and no organic preservation at all, as I'm sure you all know. And therefore, we need good preservation, good organic preservation to find these things in terminal Pleistocene sites. So this, for instance, is a picture of a bullet point from a uh, terminal Pleistocene soil at the Page Ladson site. It's in situ, and we were able to radiocarbon date four pieces of stuff right around it, which is because it was found in an underwater setting and it was much better preserved, right? So almost all underwater sites were drowned after their creation. We don't have a lot of mer people on the landscape. They weren't living in um, cities they built under the sea. There's no Atlantis that is credible that we've seen as yet. So most underwater archaeology sites were on land or they were on the top of the water and then they sunk. And so therefore, most of them were not created that way. And they were drowned after I think people did things there and left the remains behind or after they wrecked some ships. With the exception of Florida's charnel ponds. People were deliberately burying people in shallow water there. Those are some of the few sites that were created on more underwater on purpose. Um, most of these sites were destroyed immediately or not long after or many hundreds of years after they were preserved or after they were drowned. Um, as you know, our coastlines are very, very dynamic. This was a picture off um, Pensacola Beach during Michael. You can see that would have been really bad for any sites near the coast, right? And Florida especially is, you know, subject to these megastorms that do a lot of damage to the coastlines, which you guys are all probably well more aware of than I am living where you do. Um, and, but low energy environments can have really, really good preservation. This is one of the arm bones of a juvenile mastodon from the Page Ladson site. There you see it in C2. And as, it's, as we're starting to excavate it, all that brown stuff that's around it are little individual sticks that are pieces of mastodon dung. So they were hanging out around the edge of this pond, and it infilled with the, 
Have you ever been on the edge of a pond where a lot of herd animals are? There's a lot of dung floating around the edge of it. That's what was happening. And that preserved that bone perfectly. That dates 14,500 years ago. You can see it coming up before we started conserving it. So low energy environments can preserve things really, really, really well. And even high energy environments don't necessarily destroy everything. This is an early archaic Kirk point that my thought found offshore in Appalachian Bay about 15, 20 years ago now. And the sea urchin is using it as part of its sea urchin armor. So it's like sitting on the surface, it's a well-preserved Kirk point that is still there. It's been um, utilized in secondary context, but it still exists, right? So it's not 100% destroyed all the time. So what do we know about the early Floridians? First of all, I wanted to make this to show you where the coastlines were at key points in Florida's prehistory, right? So when Paige Ladson was first occupied, uh, this is where the shoreline was compared to the modern shoreline. During the Clovis period, the yellow period is where the coastline was. You can see the coastline was changing a lot during that 300 year period and some of it would have been changing so quickly that if you were, say, hanging on the coast here and you went inland for the summer and you came back, the coastline would have been in a noticeably different place in a single year um, because of how flat the gradient is. This is 11,500, so right at the end of the Pleistocene and the beginning of the Holocene. And then at the end of the early archaic period, at 9,500 years ago, you can see the coastline still really far off of its current spot. So what do we know then? Um, recently, I went to the Florida Master site file and got Chip Birdsong to pull out of there every single site that was labeled as early archaic Paleo-Indian and a whole bunch of the diagnostic types that exist for Paleo-Indian and early archaic. And the site file had 974 sites in that category. I then went through and opened every single site form to figure out why it was called that. And if it didn't have a definite diagnostic from that period, basically I got rid of it. Not that it doesn't necessarily date to that period, but we couldn't say for sure, right? So clean it up. There are 573 components, and that map right there is the distribution of all of the diagnostic artifacts or dated sites that date to more than 9,500 years ago in Florida. Um, so fewer than 20 of those sites have been radiometrically dated. They're almost all dated by association with diagnostic artifacts, Kirk points or Bolin points or Swanee points or Clovis points or something like that. That's how we know how old they are. And obviously, their known distribution is super heavily impacted by sea level rise, right? So when we hypothesized that the first Floridians came to Florida along the coast and that they were coastal people, that is 100% totally a hypothesis. So the fact that all Paleo-Indian archaeologists in Florida are underwater archaeologists isn't because we're examining Florida and coastal sites from, you know, 14,000 years ago. It's because of preservation, which I'll talk to you about more. Um, but this distribution um, and the sea levels I got from my master student, Sean Joe, he just graduated um, last year. He's the one who redid the sea level curve for Florida and came up with a really precise one for the last, um, last part of the last ice age and through about 500 years ago. Um, so why do we go to the inland of Scylla then? Where I work, this submergence has been really a big mixed bag, right? Like the sites that are on the coast or were on the coast likely got reworked by coastal processes in many cases and got destroyed. And the ones that are inland are the representatives of folks that were living far inland and far upland during the Paleo-Indian and early archaic periods, right? Like that map I just showed you, the coast is way off this map. It doesn't even show up on this map for Paleo-Indian folks. And therefore, why do I work underwater, right? Like, just because I like to scuba dive, which is not true, scuba diving is a pain in the butt, um, and it leads to lots of small engine repairs and things like that. So, basically, it's because of the fact that as Florida shorelines drowned, aquifer levels rose, 
And the formerly isolated sinkhole ponds in the interior became part of the modern river systems in Florida. So the Osceola River at 18,000 years ago was not a river. It was little springs, probably little seeps with a little bit of moisture on them in the middle of a savanna. And as sea levels rose, it stayed that way. And as sea levels rose, it stayed that way. Just the water levels got a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And only probably around 7,000 years ago did water levels get high enough that the river started flowing. That the Swanee, the Simpson, or the Swanee River, the um, the Osceola Rivers, the Silver Rivers, all of those probably only started flowing around 7,000 years ago. Before that, they were springs that would have brought people in because they were spring-fed ponds. And people are living around these spring-fed ponds, as are all of the other animals, because they would have been like little oases, probably. Great places to get fresh water in bad times. And as those water levels rose, though, the mud infilled around the edges, like happens in all of the sinkhole ponds that you know about, and that preserved the evidence of the older people. And as water levels moved, rose, people moved farther away, and those older sites stayed preserved in what had been underwater things. So that's why I work underwater. The Osceola has all of the things that allow me to answer questions about the Paleo Indian and early archaic folks I'm interested in. They have every single type of diagnostics for Paleo Indians that we know about. They have well-preserved um, megafauna remains. How many of you guys have seen Priscilla? We know the Osceola, the mastodon that's at the Florida Museum of Natural History. He came from the Osceola River, um, as did a number of very important fossils that help us under understand the Rancho La Brea fauna. So also look at the density of yellow dots on this map. It's an enormous number of the known Paleo-Indian and early archaic sites in Florida, a big percentage of them are from the Osceola River. And when I started doing this research in 2007, I thought it was because the Osceola River was the river we looked at. But as I've started going to other rivers and visiting them, I do think that there's something unique about the geochemistry of the Osceola that has allowed things to be preserved there in ways that not all the other rivers have. So I do think that there is something about the Osceola that's letting us learn a little bit more about Paleo-Indians. Um, so where I've been working pretty much continuously since 2012 is the Paige Ladson site, right? So Paige Ladson was excavated from 1983 to 1997 by some pioneers of underwater archaeology and underwater paleontology. It was led by a joint team of David Webb and Jim Dunbar. David Webb was um, recently passed away, but he was a professor at the University of Florida in vertebrate paleontology. Jim Dunbar is still very much alive and kicking, and he was an archaeologist with the Bureau of Archaeological Research in Tallahassee. Um, is now retired and works for the Osceola Research Institute doing all kinds of other cool projects that he gets picked to do instead of being told to do by the government, I guess. Um, and they spent a lot of time excavating the site. They did all of this bits that you see here in yellow. Um, they found some numerous cultural material. Um, this is, by the way, where the, the Page Latin site is. You can see their excavation unit in yellow. And what they found, oh my gosh, letters moved off the thing. All of my OCD is bothered by this slide thing, by the way. Um, basically, what they found was mastodon tusk with cut marks in a place that would have been inside the mastodon's mouth while it was alive. And when they dated some of the mastodon dung that was inside that mastodon tusks, like cusp, what they found is that dated to around 14,400 years ago. They also found those lithic materials that you see up there on the top, some battered limestone, a couple pieces of chert, and their dates suggested that the site dated to 14,400 years ago. And when they published the book um, in 2006, it was kind of like everybody just sort of politely ignored it because they had these major critiques of the context of the site. Number one, it's underwater. Everybody knows rivers mess everything up. 
There is no way you can find a well-preserved site underwater in a river. It's like canon and archaeology. If it's in the river, it's gone, right? It's been destroyed. And partly, though, is it possible that, you know, who can check this out? Because it's a tradition in Paleo-Indian archaeology that if you have an interesting, unique, challenging site, you call all of the other Paleo-Indian archaeologists you know, and they come look at your site, and they tell you what's wrong with it, and then you figure out a way to say, is this true, or is it really something that's wrong with it, or do I just need to do more tests, right? Like, that's been the model in Paleo-Indian archaeology for... Well, since the Folsom site was found, they called a whole bunch of people over from the Smithsonian, and they called people from the Denver Museum, and they all came and looked at the Folsom site in 1927 and said, oh, holy cow, you do have stone tools. Oh, this is Bison Antiquist. This is definitely a real site. Oh my gosh, we got to change everything we know. And that's been the model for this entire time. Um, so the other questions, though, is, okay, you got some artifacts. Are they really in place? And second of all, you're on the edge of a pond, and are those cut marks on that tusk really human-made? Because I don't know if you guys have ever seen elephant feet, but elephant feet are very scaly, and they got lots of bits on the bottom of them. And so if they're hanging out around the edge of a pond and wallowing and stomping on stuff, they maybe could cause scratches on a fresh tusk, right? Like maybe that's an accidental thing. Um, basically, the default idea in all archaeological sites is that everything in them is made by nature and people didn't do any of them. And in older sites in Paleo-Indian studies, that's something we have to work harder to disprove. If you're at a Wheaton Island site, people would be like, yeah, you're an idiot. Obviously, this is human-made. But for these older sites, it's something that we have to work with and we have to think about, right? So they also found, not in any of the excavation units, these projectile points at the page lads in sight. And what they are are these lanceolate shapes that aren't fluted like Clovis points, but they're long and skinny and narrow and kind of look a little bit like Clovis points. And they haven't been found at very many sites in Florida. So the original excavators proposed that maybe these were the diagnostic artifacts those folks were using to kill the mastodon. But they were all found in eroded contexts, not associated with anything datable. So it's hard to say for sure. So I finished my PhD dissertation in 2012, and when I finished it, I was working on some other underwater sites in the Osceola River. I was working on some that dated to the late Paleo-Indian period, and I was doing the geoarchaeological context of them. I was diving and digging holes and doing coring and stuff like that and trying to figure out how old they were. So nobody had been working at page, or page license since 97 because of some complicated political stuff that had happened. And my dissertation advisor, Mike Waters, uh, approached John Ladson and said, hey, is there any chance anybody could go back and try to resolve these ambiguities about the Paige Ladson site? And he's like, well, I met Jessie a couple times. She didn't seem like she's a horrible monster. Sure, you guys can go back and maybe do some more work there. And so Mike was like, hey, do you want to go back and do a postdoc excavating Paige Ladson and trying to resolve these questions about are there actually a more than Clovis component? And if so, what was going on at the site? And yeah, basically I was like, um, yes, of course, that's, I totally want to do that. So in 2012, 2013, and onwards, we've been excavating at the Paige Ladson site. We've excavated a number of units. We now have almost 150 radiocarbon dates because we just sent a whole bunch of new ones in after our excavations this summer. And we found in 2013 what you see there, which is a stone by face that was definitely flaked by people. That's Mike Waters right there holding it up. He happened to be visiting the site the day we found it, though he doesn't dive, so there's no way he dropped it out of his wetsuit for us to find or anything like that. Um, and so basically what we found is that and a few other artifacts we also found more bones of two different mastodons, that original um, elderly mastodon that the tusk was found on. We found baby mastodon, we found camel, we found horse bones, and um, those artifacts like that one that you see right there. And so that helped confirm that around 14,550 years ago, people were around this landscape. And the reason we know it was 14,550 years ago is 
This is a cross-section of our excavation units and all of the known cores and excavation units from all years at the site. That's a drawing of the biphase, so you can see the marks on it a little bit better. Where the biphase came from, where you can see the arrow going up, we collected about 40 radiocarbon dates, like above, around, below it, of all those little twigs of mastodon dung, which is really handy, have not well-preserved mastodon dung. And the ages average in the whole swath above and below it, those are basically plotted by depth there. The average around 14,500 right at the elevation that the biface is. So what these little blurbs are that are too old is there are bits of cypress. All of them were bald cypress and the layer under the cultural layer at Page Ladson is this really dense old cypress peat. So what we think those are is when the mastodons were doing their stomping around, they occasionally worked up older stuff into the younger stuff and that's why. So basically we learned not to date cypress at a site because it's always going to be too old because it's coming from the older layers. But if we date anything else, we get consistent ages. So what did we find? We found six unambiguous artifacts, including that by face. We had worked flake and a few other flakes, and they're all made of church. Uh, coastal Plain Church from the broader um, Swanee Church area, which is Bob can talk to you a lot more about than I can, but basically it's the entirety of Jefferson and Taylor counties pretty much, um, offshore and inshore. There's a number of outcrops there. And these are all made of that kind of church, but not from within the Page Ladson site. They're within a couple of kilometers, you can get really good shirt, but not actually at the sinkhole. So they have come away from a little bit away. And our new dates let us know how old that material is, that it's more like 14,500 years old. So what does that tell us, though? Well, here's a close-up of the artifacts, and it gives us some definite, okay, people were here, right? That's great. And we looked at the tusk. Well, I didn't look at the tusk. Um, Dan Fisher, a man who's actually butchered numerous elephants and done a lot of research on elephants all over the world, looked at the tusk. And he said that the marks on it were most likely made by somebody or some group of people chopping away the bone that's holding the tusk in place using some sort of material, like basically peeling out the skin, chopping away that little bit of bone, and basically screwing the tusk out of its socket. Because there's a ligament that runs along tusks that hold them in place. Elephants do a lot with their tusks. They dig with them, they fight with them, they groom each other with them, they do lots of stuff. And so there's a really strong ligament in there that holds them from moving. But if you chop open their jaw and slice that ligament, then they're easy to remove. So he thinks what the marks are on it, that you can see there in that kind of SEM image, image that like those bumps, is people doing that and then wiggling it out and the little bone fragments that are there from the skull is what is causing the, the cut marks. It wasn't that people were cutting it along, it's basically as it wiggles out. So you may very reasonably ask, why don't people go to all that work and then leave it in the bottom of the pond? We don't know. But that cavity, that tusk cavity, would have like about nine pounds of really fatty meat in it. So it's possible that's what they wanted. They just wanted the fat in the tusk cavity. Like that might have been a delicacy for them. It's also possible they only found one of the tusks. They only needed one at that time, but they basically took both of them out and threw, them, threw the other one in the pond and were planning to come back and get it the next year. They were essentially hashing it for later and they never came back. We don't know. But that's the most reasonable explanation for right now. So, what does Paige Ladson leave us? We have artifacts that are clearly made by people in undisturbed geological deposits with clear association between those artifacts and the stratigraphy, and it's dated by more than 150 radiocarbon dates now. So that's pretty unambiguous evidence that people are on the landscape by 14,000 450 years ago, right? All of those things are helping us understand people on the landscape. And just to give you a picture, this is what the Mastodon dung pebbles look like. They're mixed with sand and all of the, like that bright shiny yellow thing there. That's a stick 
that was chewed up by a mastodon and spit out or, you know, came out the other end um, around this pond at that time. And those are some of the things we're dating. All of those little yellow specks that you're seeing that look like hay, they kind of were. They were mastodon hay. And as far as I can tell, what mastodons ate was a whole lot of grapes, because there's a lot of grape skins, a lot of great curly vine bits. They liked curcubita people, like big gourds and slush, so they probably were there in the fall eating all of those things and leaving their remains along with things. And as far as I can tell, elephants have the least efficient digestive systems ever because a lot of that stuff came through with the bark still on it, if there were twigs and stuff. So I don't know what they were digesting, but it wasn't very much. So we also dated other parts of the sink and found that there's a younger archaeological component, which we did know about because um, Jim Dunbar et al. had done some excavations there of the early archaic bowling component, which dates to this period called the Younger Dias, which was everything's going along swimmingly and getting really nice at the end of the last day stage, and then it gets really cold really fast again. It gets awful. And the data at this site shows that it went from getting pretty wet and there's lots of good things going on to for a thousand years there was a drought, more or less, right? And so things were good and then not so good and the Bolan people are hanging out around the landscape at this point in time. And so basically what we see is early on it's kind of cool and dry and then it gets, and the water levels are low and people are hanging out around it. And then it gets warmer and wetter and the water levels come up and they create all these layers they are laying. So basically as water levels are going up, visualize those layers being laid in. And then things get really dry and miserable. And this is what that layer looks like, which if you're a geologist, this probably looks exciting to you for all the rest of you. Just <laughs> pretend like you don't care and smile and nod at me. But basically what you have is this black layer right here that's full of manganese and it's really clayey and it has almost nothing directly datable in it. And it's at numerous sites in the Osceola River. It's gotten to the point where I look down and be like, okay, there's black dirt, that's probably our younger driest level. And that's where you'd find Clovis and Bolin material if you have them preserved, right? And so that's the pictures from um, Paige Ladson. This is the exact same thing from Sloth Hole, a ways down the river that's a pretty famous um, close site. And we found some ability to date some of those. What we found is that there are both Bolins and Greenbriars. So remember I showed you this Bolin picture before? Those are the two sticks that were dated and those are the dates that came out for them. Those are really far apart. You will notice like a thousand years, a little more than a thousand years if you're good at math in your head really quickly, right? And they're at the exact same level, about 10 centimeters apart. And what that's showing is that little soil layer was just sitting there for like a thousand years and it's only that thick and it was being homogenized. Every time the water would come up, people would stomp around on it, things would get mixed up. And what we found is there's, so in this picture right here, that's like bullet point. That picture right there, that white circle is around a green red point. And this right here is that tape measure right there. It's the same unit, the same level. And the green wire point was like four centimeters in the same level above the bowling point. So like basically they're supposed to date like 800 or 1,000 years apart. And we have dates that encompasses that whole period on the exact same surface at the exact same time. So it's kind of mixing all of that sort of stuff. And what I think that is, is this site right here is the Ryan Harley site. It's in about six feet of water, not even maybe five feet of water, basically, if you head down the dig with your scuba tank on. This was a day that it rained like crazy. You see how sloppy and muddy that is? And you walk through it and your feet sink all the way through, about 10 centimeters of a really soft, squishy soil. We came back the next week, it was totally dry again. Um, and that's what was happening every time we were working at that site. Like, that's what I think Paige Ladson looked like during the Younger Dress. Any time it rained, it got gross like that, but people were still right on the water's edge doing stuff and things got homogenized. So there's really rich material cultural assemblage there. Um, Jim Dunbar uh, and Brennan Carter did a lot more studies of it. They found hearths and they found 
Food remains, they found um, lots and lots of artifacts. We just dug a two by two through it, so we'd only found a little bit. After that, things get nice again. Things start to dry out, but they also start having more water level, water's coming back up, it's filling the whole thing in, and then we're also having lots of storminess. So what this graph is, it looks like nothing except a wiggle chart. That's what it's supposed to look like. Basically what it is, is it's looking through our sediment at how much magnetic material is in the sediment. And the reason why that matters is in the calcium carbonate that is the sinkhole that is Page Ladson, there's no magnetic material. The limestone that makes up the sink. The only place the magnetic stuff can come from is Georgia, which is not far, but it's not in the sinkhole. So when you're seeing that in the early Holocene, that's showing that there's mini storms bringing like major flash flooding or major stuff going on. It might be hurricanes, we don't know exactly, but basically some crazy stuff is going on around 9,000 years ago through about 5,000 years ago at Page Ladson. And that's a proxy for me what's going on in the environment overall. And we're just starting to figure that out. We're doing some more stuff to learn about that. And then by the, basically as we get to the younger part of the modern sequences, we start seeing that the water goes up and stays up. So what's the world like for these folks? During the, during the first occupation of Page Ladson, it was an open dry savanna, it was isolated water holes, and people at Page Ladson might not have known the ocean existed. It was more than 100 kilometers away, and they were about 80 meters above modern seas. Like, they were really far. It's basically like people from inland Georgia knowing about the coast, right? Like, today it's easy to know about that, but would you have known about it if you didn't have, you know, horses, cars, cell phones, things like that? So, these folks were inland foragers. And we have a lot that we are learning about paleo environments from this site as well. Basically, looking at those sediments are telling us when elephants probably went extinct. So they're really common in these early sediments. During that younger driest period, they're gone. And then during the early Holocene, people are showing up again, or I mean elephant, or bison are showing up again. So what does Paige Ladson tell us? The by the close people period, in Florida, people had been here for a thousand years. And because they knew about these tiny little places really far inland and really far upland, they were probably everywhere. Probably everywhere in North America, but almost certainly everywhere in Florida. And these folks probably lived with the megafauna at least 2,000 years before those megafauna went extinct, based on those sediment proxies that I just showed you. So what do we know about this? We only know about it because of the excellent organic preservation underwater. How many of you guys have dug a hole in your life that found five flakes and a piece of biface in it? Probably any of you who volunteered on a site have found that assemblage in a day that you've dug, right? That's, and there's nothing special about that. The only thing that's special about it is that we were able to get 150 radiocarbon dates around it that helps us know that it has to be that old. So what are the implications of that? First of all, context matters. That biface is not a pretty biface, it's just a chunk of a knife. It never was part of a point. And unlike these, which are probably projectile points, we have no idea how old they are and we never will until we find any of them in C2. And so we can't use them to create our regional chronology of what's going on in the early Paleo-Indian period unless we get some dates. Um, but what we found from working in these submerged sinkholes is that things don't seem to be moving up and down the river willy-nilly. They seem to be staying in the pond that they're in forever. So that seems to be the important implication of it. That's what seems to be the take-home lesson. If you find bolin in a sinkhole, there was a bolin site around that sinkhole at one point in time. It wasn't a bolin site in Georgia that ended up in your site. Like they're from there. That's probably the most important take-home message. So back to the big picture, we can say that Paige Ladson shows that 
The Ice Free Corridor could not have been the main way people got to the Americas because recent research shows the Ice Free Corridor didn't exist until way after the Page Ladson component, and in fact, not even until the end of the Clovis period, right? Like, it wasn't even available for folks before the Clovis period. Um, therefore, we know basically Page Ladson was occupied by 14,500, therefore, people could not have come. Um, after 13,000 and been the first people. And DNA evidence shows that the first Americans, the oldest skeletons that we have, all have Native American DNA, so they're related to modern Native Americans, but they also are most closely related to folks that were in Asia um, during the terminal Pleistocene. And the two ancient skeletons that we have good DNA from also show most close relatedness with modern Native Americans. So on these pictures, what we're seeing is red equals more closely related. Um, and one of them's a skeleton from Central Asia, and one of them's the Anzic skeleton that was found in Montana. And what that's showing us is that the first Native Americans were from Siberia originally, and they're ancestral to modern Native Americans. So that gets rid of one route completely. And what that leaves us with are two possible options. Did we get here really, really, really long time ago? Or did people come by boat along the coast by 17,000 years ago? And that leaves us with some testable hypotheses and some complications. So Clovis is a coastal people. So how do you go from being coastal people to inland people if that's what happened? Also, we don't have any direct evidence of this coastal migration because the coasts have been drought, right? So we need to resolve this, but we haven't done it yet. So what do we got to do? We still have got to find more sites. We've got to keep looking to understand what happens, especially offshore, right? Though all of you probably have been on boats and you know how complicated it is to work offshore. More time, more money, more danger, more all kinds of stuff. And this is just a picture of us doing some survey in another chunk of the Osola. That right there is a mastodon bone that part of it just got eroded out of the bottom of the river. The, but the darkly stained part's been exposed for a while. So thanks so much. This isn't exactly the talk I was going to give you, but hopefully it covers some of the stuff you're interested in. Thank you. You're not all asleep, I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah. Okay, so you talked about the length of time that people would have taken simply to get from Alaska down to Florida. So if you're at 14,500 in Florida, uh, how early do you think they had to have been up there in the Northwest? And how does that fit with crossing? Right, um, that's a really good question. So uh, I think the oldest would have to have been no more than about 18,000 based on our models of how the glaciers melt away from up there. Um, but I think that any time after that, it could have been people coming along the coast. I don't know how long it would have taken to travel along the coast, but I do think it could have been pretty quick because people in boats fishing and using coastal resources like moving from north to south, you don't have to learn a lot of new technologies to get shellfish in British Columbia and shellfish in South America. They're in kind of similar environments. They're kind of similar ways that you maintain them or if you're hunting seals or anything like that. So I think they could have moved pretty quickly that way. You also can move a lot of possessions by boat that way with that you would, if you have to walk over land, you wouldn't be able to. So I think any time after 18,000, um, most of the more credible pre-Clovis sites on the west coast are in that 16,000 range, so I think even 16,000 would have been a reasonable time, but that's still an open question. I just don't think it was before 21,000 because there were glaciers way up the coast and it would have been not a fun place to be then also, and also the archaeological record from um, Northeast Asia doesn't really have a lot of people in it during that time period, right? Like you need people in Asia to come to the New World. They can't just spontaneously generate like it's a video game. So I think that that's part of it. Yes? Um, 
on your map you have shown as one of the possible or one of the hypotheses uh, for Clovis and pre-Clovis as the European connection, the Soviet mm -hmm. connection. You didn't talk about it, so I'm assuming that you know you don't believe in that. And I know it's very controversial. Can you just explain a little bit for everybody about what that entails and, and why it's accepted or not accepted? Right, so basically what I was covering in those last slides is all the DNA evidence we have right now doesn't show any Asian contribution to modern Native American populations or, and it's a very small sample size, ancient skeletons, right? It all shows connections to... Um, to Northeast Asia. So that's basically why I said the Solutrean hypothesis isn't supported for who colonized the New World. Maybe there were some folks in boats that came over from Europe and landed in North America, but they did not make any genetic contributions to modern Native American populations or to those ancient, those few ancient skeletons that we have. So that's basically why I say that isn't supported. But basically what the Solutrean hypothesis is in a nutshell, it was proposed by um, Dennis Stanford at the, uh, the Smithsonian and Bruce Bradley is a really famous flint napper. They looked at materials from Spain during um, the very end of the Solutrean period and noted that there were artifacts made in similar ways to Clovis artifacts. Now the real problem with the Solutrean hypothesis in my mind and has always been the real problem is Clovis dates around 13,200 years. The Solutrean, the youngest, youngest Solutrean site, and this is really stretching the radiocarbon dates, is like 18,000 years. So that's 5,000 years in which there's no cultural change and there's no archaeological sites in Europe or in America that are making Clovis materials or Solutrean materials. So it's hard to say there's a genetic continuity between those, right? Like there's just huge gaps in the data. Like, so, and that's a problem that can't be explained. Even if there's pre-Clovis sites in America that stretch back to 18,000 years ago, they're not making Clovis, they're not making materials the way Clovis materials are. So the lines of evidence just don't support it, right? I don't, so I don't see it as a very well-supported hypothesis based on that, right? And there are some folks that do still see it strongly, and if you really want to talk to me about it, I will totally bog you down in as many details as you want, but I'm sure most of you want to nap now or, you know, be like, oh my god, why won't she shut up? So, um, I'll, I'll talk to anyone individually about that later if they want. Yeah. So, um, a lot of page Latin is based on mastodon bone. Yeah. Or fecal bat or whatever you want to call Yeah, absolutely. And you're saying that they don't, from what you can see, they don't have a very good digestive system, which I find hard to believe for such a huge animal. Has anyone looked at compared to Asian or African elephant digestive systems and say, okay, yeah, this is kind of the way right, it is. Like, are. So okay. proboscideans need to eat, I forget what it is, yeah. several hundred pounds yeah. of food every few days, right? Like they, they do not process them. They're not cows. They don't have like six stomachs and they don't have um, cud and stuff like that. So it is typical of proboscideans. It's just ridiculous when you're digging through it. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to answer that as far as current uh, Elephants. The uh, there was an article in today's paper about oh. a quirky gin being made out of uh, elephant dung. Oh, cool! And, uh, and it's because so much of the floral material and herbal material has gone undigested that it's able to be used to ferment and make a liquor. Well, I guess so, people pay a fortune for a coffee that's gone through the intestines of a goat. Maybe they'll pay even more for gin that went through an elephant, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's called the Paige Latson site, and I see you give credit to uh, Latson family for letting you do the right. operation, but Buddy Page was the amateur diver that found that site. Absolutely. I think you should give him credit. Well, I'm thanking the people that directly helped me. He died before I ever met him. I never got a chance to, and yeah, he does deserve credit. He was a crazy, intrepid man, and I never was lucky enough to meet him. He passed away the year before I started working in Florida, so I've never met him. I'm assuming you got to work with him a bunch. And yeah, he was, I mean, he did a huge service coming forward with finding that site, and we wouldn't know about it if they, if they didn't, and, you know, if he had talked to those folks. So he'd like, yeah, it was super important. Thank you all. I'll talk to you in the